Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Living Traditions Homestead. You know, there's some things that happen around the homestead that no matter how well prepared you think you are, uh, you just kind of get blindsided and yeah, you're just never really as prepared as you think you are. So today we want to talk with you about one of those situations that happened to us recently. Now to take you back a few months, our very first milk cow, Hope, became really sick and uh, Unfortunately, we had to put her down. And prior to that, a couple months prior to that, she actually had a very sick calf that we had to put down too. So we were feeling pretty beat down when it came to dairy cows, but we absolutely love having them on the homestead. And we really feel like for us, it's the most important animal on our homestead. Now, even though we're now a couple years into having dairy cows here on the homestead, uh, we, we do realize that there's always more that we can learn that, uh, you know, that process is going to take years and years and years before we feel like we know, you know, even most of what we should know. But after we had to put Hope down and after we lost her calf, Henry, we really, you know, kind of dove into learning more about dairy cows, learning more about the things that can possibly go wrong or what symptoms to look for, learning, you know, more about the disease that ended up actually taking uh, Hope's life, which was uh, bovine leukemia, and just really hoping that in the future we'd be able to, you know, spot things early on. Maybe we missed something with Hope that could have helped us had we caught it sooner. And we just really felt like this time around things were going to be a lot different. So just recently we brought a Jersey heifer home and within about two weeks she calved another heifer calf. Since then, we've had her up on the milking stand. We named her Rose and her calf is named Babe. And so we've been putting Rose up on the milking stand. It's the first time she's ever been milked and she's been doing a really great job. Her calf, Babe, is growing really well and they're both doing really great. But about two weeks ago, we started having a problem with Rose. So after we had to put Hope down and we started doing more reading, one of the things that we read a lot about, because it can be a pretty major issue with dairy cows, is mastitis. Uh, it's one of those things that we thought, we, we, you know, we read all of the articles, we've watched YouTube videos, we've seen what other people have experienced, and we really thought that mastitis was one of those things that, if it were to ever happen to us, uh, you know, we'd be able to catch those symptoms super early and it wouldn't be a very major problem for us here on our homestead. About two weeks ago when I was milking, there was one of her quarters on her udder that was really hard. And when I milked her out, barely any milk came out and I knew that that was a classic sign of mastitis. Now, there were a couple pieces of that puzzle that we hadn't put together. For just a couple days prior to uh, Sarah discovering that, that uh, quarter of the udder that was super hard and, and swelling, swelled up, we had noticed that her milk looked just a tiny bit more yellow than normal. Not like, not like a gross yellow, not anything, you know, super alarming. We didn't really know what would have caused that, but it just looked a little bit more yellow than normal. And we didn't know at the time that that could be the sign of mastitis starting. And about that time when we started noticing that the milk was just a tiny bit different color, when we strained the milk, we started seeing just a couple little particles um, in the strainer, but we didn't think it was anything a big deal. And we thought for sure that if she would develop mastitis, we would definitely know that something was wrong. So that brings us to, you know, the day that Sarah found that, that quarter. Uh, we realized that, you know, obviously she had mastitis. By that point, there was no denying it. And really, you know, even though we had done all the reading, all the watching of other videos, we quickly realized that we had never experienced this before. And that until you start to go through something, uh, it's really hard to pick up on those subtle signs uh, from just watching a video or reading books. It was one of those things that now suddenly we were in the middle of this and we had to quickly figure out what else we didn't know. 
What we did know is that we had a way to confirm whether or not that was mastitis, and that was through the California mastitis test, the CMT test, which is pretty well known about and used on most dairies. Right, it's a test that you can do right on the farm. Right, so you mix a little bit of the milk with a little bit of the test reagent, and if it gels up, then there is mastitis in that quarter. So we decided to do the CMT test just to confirm it. We did a test of each quarter, and what we found out was not only did she have mastitis pretty bad in that quarter, she actually had mastitis in all four of her quarters. Right. So we got on the phone right away with our vet. Uh, we have a great vet who, who actually spent a lot of years working in the dairy industry, so he's very good with dairy cows. We got on the phone with him, we explained what was going on, we told him we thought it was, you know, it was just kind of starting and we needed some advice from him as to what to do. So we actually gave her uh, antibiotics, intramammary antibiotics that you actually push up through the teat and massage into each one of the quarters. Uh, he instructed us to do that for three days and we also were given an injection of antibiotics just to make sure to just get it taken care of right away. And so we did those things for three days hoping that that would just take care of it all. Right. Now, I know there are some people, especially in the homesteading community, who are dead set against ever using antibiotics. We want to clarify our position on using antibiotics. Um, we're not dead set against using antibiotics. If it comes down to one of our animals suffering or even possibly dying uh, or using antibiotics to treat them and treat them in a humane way, uh, we're going to use antibiotics every time. Now, we don't believe in using antibiotics when there's not a problem. Uh, we don't believe in using antibiotics as a preventative type medicine. But when there is clearly a problem and antibiotics are known to cure that problem, uh, we will use antibiotics every time at the you know, direction of our veterinarian. So we used the antibiotics that he prescribed and told us to do as directed. And after four days, not only was she not getting better, but she actually all of a sudden got a lot worse. Yeah, we came out for our nightly milking and she was standing out in the pasture where she normally is when we come down. But normally, as soon as she sees us coming out with all of the milking supplies, she's up at the barn, just standing there waiting for you know, us to milk. But this night, she just stood out in the field. She wouldn't come up to the barn at all. She, you know, was barely walking. I mean, she just stood there. You could just tell by her demeanor that she wasn't feeling good at all. So we called her and she didn't come. Uh, we went up to her and she barely responded. She was standing. We were able to coax her into the barn, right. but she just- Right, reluctantly. Yeah, she wasn't interested at all. And you could really tell that right. she didn't feel good. Yeah, she wouldn't eat any of her feed that night. Right, so we, when we got her up on the stand, we took her temperature and she had a fever. Her temperature was 105.4. Yeah, which, is not good. A normal temperature for a cow is around 101. So the fact that hers was 105.4 uh, was a very bad sign. That on top of the way that she was acting, we just knew that uh, it was, it was, you know, things were progressing in the wrong direction. We were able to get in touch with our vet. He decided he needed to examine her and to figure out the best course of action. When he came out and examined her, he realized that the mastitis had gone systemic and we needed to switch antibiotics. He actually gave her an intravenous antibiotic. We went from there and over time, over the course of, you know. The next couple weeks. Yeah, you know, she slowly got better and better. The antibiotics stayed with her for quite a while and were working in the background. We had stopped giving her the intramammary uh, antibiotics because it didn't seem like she was responding to those. But the systemic antibiotics ended up clearing up her mastitis, but it was a good 10 days to two weeks to get her completely back to normal. Right, so since that time we've been doing the CMT or the California mastitis test every couple days just to make sure that it stays resolved. Uh, we're actually going to do another one of those tests today in just a little while when we take you guys out into the barn with us to milk. Um, but 
Uh, as of right now, it seems like everything is cleared up. She's headed back in the right direction. Uh, we still have a lot to learn about raising dairy cows, you guys. We don't claim to know it all. We realize that even though we're a couple of years into it, uh, that really is nothing at all when it comes to all of the possible problems that can go wrong. So in hindsight, I think the, our biggest takeaway from all of this is that we need to be doing that California mastitis test or that CMT test more often. Uh, we're actually going to be doing it weekly from now on. What we were relying on was for us to be able to see clinical signs of mastitis. Uh, you know, the change in the milk color, the swelling, any kind of clumping, fever. But what we didn't realize is that the CMT test can show subclinical signs or signs of mastitis that are present before anything that you can see um, before that happens. So we've decided that at least weekly we will be doing the cmt test and we encourage you all anybody who is raising dairy animals to do the same thing right yeah had we been doing that all along on a more frequent basis we may have been able to catch this infection really early on and you know probably just treat it with just a couple days of a, of a lower dose antibiotic and knock it out of her system uh, but really because of our own lack of knowledge and our own lack actually real experience our lack right. of experience because I, right. I really feel like you can read every textbook, every blog post, every article out there and really feel prepared. But until you really see it with your own eyes right. and have that personal experience, sometimes you just won't know right. until it happens to you. Right. It's not really a lack of knowledge. It's like Sarah said, a lack of experience. Um, you know, there, and there's a difference between the two and we're learning that the longer that we're homesteading, the longer that we're farming, uh, we definitely have learned that there is, you know, knowledge, which is good to have, but nothing beats experience. So you guys, let's go ahead and get Rose in the milking stand. There are some changes that we've made in our milking procedures to lessen the chance of her getting mastitis. But I also want to show you guys how we do the CMT test, uh, just to give you some experience with that. And we'll go from there. And lastly, I want to show you, which is something you all have been asking for, how we clean our milking system. So after we milk her, we'll take you in the house and clean everything up and show you what we do. All right, let's head out to the barn. Rose is excited to get milked. I can hear her over there. She sees us and she knows that that is time for milking. So let's head out to the barn. Now that we're in the barn, we can show you some of the changes that we've made in our milking process to help make sure that nothing that we are doing in this process will uh, give her mastitis. We're also gonna be showing you the whole process of the CMT test or the California mastitis test, how that works and uh, the results for today. I know that she is anxious to get in here, so we're, out, we're really all set up to start this milking process. So I'm gonna let her in, uh, get her all set, and then we'll get started. You ready, Rose? Come on. I'm gonna sweep off some of this stuff that she tracked onto the milking stand. These days I've started wearing gloves during the milking process. I don't want any of the bacteria that I might have on my hands while I'm touching her and cleaning her to be the source of bacteria that would get up inside of her udder and cause her to have mastitis. So uh, that is one change that we've been doing throughout all of this process. I'm going to start off with uh, washing her udder with just a, a soapy kind of bleach water solution on a couple of clean sanitized rags to make sure that there's no manure or mud debris that would uh, potentially get sucked into uh, the, milky, the milky machine, the inflations. Then I move to the teats and do the same thing. I wash each of the teats with a separate space on the rag, on a clean rag, just to get any manure off of there. And then I do a first round of teat dip. 
Now teat dip is um, an iodine solution that will kill um, any bacteria that is on the teats. It also has an emollient or like a lotion in it that helps uh, nourish the skin of the teats to keep them nice and uh, healthy so that they don't get dry and cracked. But before I milk, I don't want all of this dripping iodine solution to go into the milk, so I'm just gonna dry those off with some paper towels. Now, because there could be some bacteria and old milk that's stored up inside these teats, we need to get that out before we start milking and before we do the CMT test, which is what we're gonna do next. So I just squirt out a couple squirts of milk from each teat, but I'm also looking to see if there is any color difference in the milk. Uh, when, when Rose had my mastitis really badly, her milk kind of turned a little yellow. Um, and different bacterias and different staph or strep bacterias will cause the milk to come, become a different color. So I'm also looking at that. When we do the CMT test, we use a paddle. This is a CMT test paddle. It has four little cups that you squirt some milk into, uh, and then you put the reagent in it, swirl it around, and if it gels up, then there's evidence of some infection starting. There is one little circle for each part of the udder, each section. You can see I have milk in every little section. There's only a certain amount of milk you need. So if you have too much, you can just tip it out a little bit. There's a line that shows you how much milk should be in there. So we have the right amount of milk. We just need to put the reagent in to each section of the cup. And then you swirl it around for about 10 to 30 seconds to see if there is any gelling. So we're gonna pour this out and we're gonna watch the stream of each one to see if it looks like any of them have turned into a gel or if they just pour out kind of like water. I think it looks great. I don't think there's any evidence of mastitis. So we can move on to milking. If you've seen our milkers in the past, you've seen that we use a surge milker. We just recently found an antique de Laval bucket and we really enjoy it. It's easier to carry the milk in. I also like to hold the hoses. I know there's are ways that you can strap them up um, so that you don't have to hold them, but I really don't mind it. I like being close to the cow as I'm milking her, um, and so it really isn't a big deal for me. And then we, we finish off with another round of the teat dip so that no bacteria can get sucked up inside of there. It's completely sanitized. She can go back out into the pasture and be really nice uh, and germ-free. You ready to go? All right, bye.
Now that she's done being milked, it's time for me to clean everything up and make sure that there is uh, as little bacteria, as little um, manure things that got tracked in on her feet, make sure that's all off the milking stanchion uh, so that it's clean the next time she comes in. Now, we have always cleaned up after we've milked. We've always made sure that the things are swept off and everything like that, but we're going like the extra mile now, since we've experienced a pretty serious case of mastitis, we just wanna make sure that everything is as clean as possible. Now, when we had the vet out to um, help get her well again, he did compliment us and say that this is like the cleanest he's ever seen a milking stanchion, milking area, uh, definitely in comparison to commercial dairies. So um, I think we're doing something right in this area and I'm pretty proud of that. Um, I just, I start off by just sweeping off any of the dry stuff. You know, she tracks in bedding and she's got mud on her feet, manure on her feet. I just sweep that off first as best as I can. Then I use the uh, soapy bleach water solution that I brought out to help clean her up. I pour that on here so that I can actually scrub off any debris that she tracked in. I have this nice scrub brush that I picked up from Walmart. And then I, I bring in with me a, a bucket of a couple gallons of bleach water and then I just use that to rinse all this down. And then it just air dries until the next time that we milk. Now that everything out here is cleaned up, we can move into the house and I'm going to show you how we clean all of our milking equipment. All right, we're back in the house. We're going to start taking the milker apart getting everything ready to clean. Now typically the way our procedure works is while Sarah's finishing up in the barn, while she's doing that whole uh, procedure of scrubbing the, the rubber pad and putting the bleach down and all of that, during that time I'll bring the milker in and start taking everything apart so that we can get it cleaned up uh, as quickly as we can after milking so that none of the milk dries in the hoses or anything like that. So I'll show you that part and then Sarah's going to show you how we actually wash it. So the first thing that we'll do is is we'll fill our sink with some warm water or actually hot water then we're going to add just a little bit of bleach now we don't really measure it out but you know just a, a glug for lack of a better term of bleach probably you know an eighth of a cup if that and then we're going to use some uh, dish soap as well So basically clean up is just like washing dishes, really. With the soapy bleach water, I just make sure that I wash every little part of it. Now there are some parts that could get like milk stuck in them and stuff. And I use um, just a little, you know, pipe cleaner thing on a wire to get through any of these areas that could have milk stuck in them. Rinse it with hot, hot water. Then everything just air dries until the next time that we use it. Now, one thing that we hear a lot when we tell people that we um, milk with a machine with just one cow is, you know, it just takes so much time. All that cleanup just takes so much time. Why would you do that? And honestly, when I'm not filming a video about how to clean your milker, it really takes me like 10 minutes. The scrubbing and everything outside after I milk takes me about two minutes. So it really doesn't take a whole lot of time once you get into the groove of everything. You know, when you're hand milking, there is an opportunity for a lot of things to fall into the milking bucket. And yes, you strain that out so you it wouldn't end up in your milk. But the milking machine is just so contained that once you sanitize everything and you put the inflations on, there is very little risk of contaminants getting into your milk. And so I really do just still 
feel that the best thing for our family, not for everybody's family, the best thing for our family is to use the milking machine. About these inflations and these, uh, these lines here for the pump that we cannot get this over here wet. And so I make sure that I keep it far away. It never falls into the water. I'm able to wash the inflations um, separately with a rag and down inside of there. And then I use my wire brush all the way down inside of there. Make sure I get that clean on both of them. And then these hang dry until the next time that we need them. Next, I have the milking lines and it's really important for me to get these really clean. Milk has kind of a sticky texture that even though I could run hot soapy bleach water down in here, it's not gonna get all of that kind of stuck on milk down in there. So it's important for me to use this uh, wire this kind of cleaning thing, and I just put it down in there a couple times. This wire doesn't reach the, the other side, so I do it twice from both ends, and that works really well. I know this seems like a lot of monkey business, but it really isn't that big of a deal. It doesn't really take me that long. do the second one. Okay, so these are all washed. They're gonna get hung up. Next up is our new bucket. <clears throat> one thing that I'm doing um, now after Rose has had mastitis is I'm cleaning the tea dip um, container in between every milkings and that's something that I hadn't done before and I guess I didn't really know that you should do that um, because bacteria can get trapped in there and just multiply and you're you're putting that up on the most vulnerable part of your cow every time you milk um, and so I've been making sure to clean the cup part and sanitize it in between every milking just to make sure that I'm not the reason why bacteria is being introduced into that very vulnerable part of the cow. It just comes apart easily, gets washed easily, and then it'll be ready again for next time. So that's pretty much it, you guys. That's how we sanitize everything uh, that is used for the milking process. So now that she's better, our job is to make sure that she doesn't get mastitis again as much as we possibly can. I think there's a real misconception that mastitis, first of all, isn't a real big deal. Uh, that it's just, you know, something that happens that maybe can affect the milk a little bit, but that's not something that's gonna really kill your cow. Uh, that is not true at all. Had we not treated this as aggressively as we did with the correct antibiotics, especially once it kind of went systemic, uh, we definitely could have lost our cow. And you know, not only do we have a lot of money invested in our cow, we really care about our animals and we really you know, want them to be healthy. We want them to live the best life that they can and provide back for our family. That's the whole reason that we're living this lifestyle. The other misconception is that mastitis is a result of dirty milking processes or dirty milking procedures. And that's not necessarily true either. While it can be. Yeah, while bacteria can get into the udder through a dirty milking process, it can come from uh, being near a pond. It can come from bacteria of the calf's mouth, uh, dirty bedding, splashing up of manure in a puddle, laying down in the dirt. Uh, so our job is to control as many of those things as we possibly can and there are lots of things that we're going to be doing differently now to do as much as we can to prevent that. Right. You know, it's not that we feel like we've been doing a bad job in the past. In fact, I think we've been doing a pretty darn good job uh, all along, but there's always things that you can improve upon and when something like this happens, it makes you kind of take a step back, 
look at all of your procedures and realize that there are just always those little tweaks that you can make to make things just a little bit better. And we wanted to make sure that we brought this information and our experience to you guys. We hear from so many of you that you're so happy that we don't just paint a picture of perfection on our homestead and in our farm. That we bring to you the mistakes that we've made and the lessons that we've learned so that you can learn them before you have to learn a hard lesson or make that mistake. And so that's why we decided to share this with you guys today. You know, this really is an amazing life to live. Uh, living out in the country, raising a lot of your own food. And most days it is almost like a fairy tale. It is really a great life, but there are times and it's not. There are times when it really uh, is kind of sad and depressing and things don't go well. And sometimes those periods last for a week or more at a time, like right. what we just went through. And uh, you know, you gotta not get down. You gotta realize that, you know, uh, people before you have gone through the same thing that you just need to learn more, you need to get more experience, and that hopefully over time you'll have less and less of those times. So if you guys enjoy learning from us and enjoy the videos that we bring to you, make sure that you hit the subscribe button and hit that like button, we would appreciate it. And remember that the best way that you can help us here on the home set is just to share our videos on all your social media. And until next time, thank you so much for stopping by our homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.